See, in most cases, I think today, there's a lot of folks having born-again experiences, as they say, deciding for Christ, saying, I've received Christ as my Savior, but they don't live any differently than anyone else in the culture. I mean, that's actually one of the scandals of our church. I think it's because their idols weren't confronted with the gospel. Paul confronted the idols of the culture so his converts changed in the way in which they lived to the extent that the very economy was affected. The culture was affected. See, every gender has a set of idols. Every culture has a set of idols. Every, every class has a set of idols. Every race has a set of idols. Every individual has a set of idols. And Paul knew what they were. Every individual life and every community and every culture that's not based on the glory and the grace of God is going to be based on some created thing in God's place. Everyone and every community and every culture looks to something uh, to save it, something to uh, rescue it. Some, it, it puts its hope, it puts its meaning, it's in something. Or money. It's a very helpful thing to have. Making money can be a great deal of fun. And if you do very well in it, you can do an awful lot of good. It's great to make money, but when it becomes the ultimate thing, when it begins, becomes the central thing in uh, the life of a culture, or the life of an individual, then you have Artemis. An idol can be anything. An idol can be family and children. It can be career or making money. It can be achievement or critical acclaim. It can be social standing, a romantic relationship. It can be comp your competence and skill. It can be physical beauty, either in yourself and or in your partner. It can be po some political or social cause. It can be your moral record. It can be, and we'll get to this in a second, uh, your religiosity and your religious activity and even your ministry success. All of those things can be idols. Here's why. When you lose one of those things, and it's just a good thing to you, then you're sad. But if you lose one of those things, and it's become an ultimate thing, it's not just a good thing, but an ultimate thing, then you want to throw yourself off a bridge. That's how you can know whether that's an idol in your life, because you can't live without it. And there's all kinds of people out there. In fact, most people in America say, I believe in God, maybe even say, I go to church. And yet, they are so invested in their career that if it goes south, or they're so invested in a particular romantic relationship, if they break up, or they're so invested in their ministry success that if it goes south, you want to kill yourself. And that shows that you're in the thrall of an idol or you're in the arms of an idol. We do have shrines and temples. In Boston, they ask, what does he know? In New York, they ask, what does he make? In Philadelphia, they ask, who's his family? Those are idols. Thing in the business world, the idol is profit. In the artistic world, the idol is self-expression. And the artist, so in the business world, they say, sure, express yourself, but not if it's going to make you lose money. In the artistic world, you express yourself, and if you make money, it's an insult. See? <laughs> You've sold out. Why have you sold out? See, because now you're like those people over there in the financial world and you see their idolatry. They sell out for money, but you've sold out. You've sold out to self-expression. What's so great about self-expression? It's an idol. Do you, do you see the idols in your vocational field? Do you see the idols in your city? Do you see the idols? Now, once you see them, if you see them, the second thing is you have to expose them. In fact, that's actually in this little synopsis because Paul doesn't just say there are many men-made gods around, but then he also says, and there are no gods at all. The idols never deliver. When idols are threatened, there's chaos, see? There's confusion, there's violence. You know, idols, when a person's in the thrall of an idol, they can be looking pretty respectful and respectable on the outside, but you threaten that idol, and they'll kill you. Trying to communicate the gospel to anybody, you need to know what their idols are because the gospel is you're saved by grace and the idol is you're saved by something else. And it's one thing to say, oh, you know, you're saved by grace, you're not justified by works, but you realize how many different forms of works there are? Do you realize how many different forms of works righteousness there really are out there? And unless, you're, unless you know what form you're talking to, how do you know how to, put the, how, how to apply the gospel to it? 
Let me give you three kinds of idols that you have to expose. Personal idols, religious idols, and cultural idols, okay? I live at an Ephesus called New York City. Let me press this home a little bit. You know, this is, I know this is going to be really shocking when I tell you this, but you know, all over New York City, there's the practice of child sacrifice. Because see, the goddess of business in, the, in, the, uh, in New York City. If you want to get in the financial world, make a lot of money, you have to sacrifice your family. How do you get into your job and not bow down? In other words, how do you make money just money? How do you demythologize it? So it's not Artemis, the goddess. How do you demythologize it? So it's not your identity, so it's not your main value, it's not your salvation. It's just money. How do you do that? Only with the gospel. We'll get back to that. Let me give you a second... Uh, uh, kind of personal idol, and that's romance, money, uh, love, romantic love, and then children. Now, in the, in the evangelical world, we don't think of children as idols, but let me tell you, there are all kinds of parents out there who essentially are looking at their children, and in their heart of hearts, they're saying, if my children are happy, if my children are believers, if my children grow up to love me, if my children are successful, then I know that I'm worth something. And if that's how you look at your children, not just as good things, but as ultimate things, and you start to live your lives out through your children, basically, what you're going to either, you're either going to, the child is either going to stay near you and live a crushed life, because the child will always be crushed under the weight of your expectations, or the child will just get as far away from you as possible. And because you have turned that child into an idol, it'll wound you in a way that you'll never get over. And you'll be mad at God. How dare God do such a thing as this? And I can't believe in God. But the, but the depth of the wound is your own making. You know, unless you know, understand personal idols, your, your counseling, your pastoring, your preaching is going to be so superficial. You're just going to be laying ideas on people, concepts on people. It's not going to touch them. You never, ever break commandments 2 through 10 without first breaking one. That the sin underneath all other sins is the sin of idolatry. And here's an example. If you lie, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments, right? You lied. But why did you lie in any particular situation? Well, you say, well, I, I lied because I was just so afraid of losing face. In other words, human opinion is more important at that moment to your self-worth and your value than Jesus, which means that's an idol. And you wouldn't have lied, except you really failed to rest in Christ as your salvation and as your righteousness. Human opinion is your salvation and your righteousness. You don't really believe the gospel at that point. You know, when people say to me, oh, I believe God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Have you ever said that? Have you ever talked to anybody who says that? That happens all the time in pastoral work. I know God's forgiven me. I can't forgive myself. You can't say, well, I, I don't know what to say. I'll give you something to say. I'll give you something to say. What it means is there's a, there's a higher God in their life than God. They failed something else. Just an example is many people are driven by parental expectations. And when they fail to, to, you know, reach those parental expectations, they hate themselves and they beat themselves up. And whenever they fail, I, I know God forgives me, I can't forgive myself. What that really means is your real God, which are your parents and your parental expectations, you see, they're cursing you because that's your God. Now it's your spiritual master. You have to expose them for what they are. They're killing you. They can't deliver. They can't give you the salvation they say they're going to give. They can't give you the social order they say they're going to give. They can't give you the joy they say they're going to give. You expose them. Very busy people in the church, very busy people in evangelical church, evangelical ministers. There's three idols that if you look carefully, we tend to trust in instead of God. Truth, gifts, and morality. Is it possible to say, I am okay, I am saved because of the rightness of my belief instead of, I'm okay because Jesus Christ died for me? Is it possible to rest your salvation, as it were, functionally in the rightness of your doctrine? You are a great communicator, or you have great musical gifts, or you have great leadership gifts or something, and as a result, your ministry is successful, and a lot of people come, and it grows. Essentially, even though you say you believe in justification by grace, you actually believe in justification by ministry. In the Reformed world, we make an idol out of being a great preacher. I know a lot of guys who, more than anything else, they want to be great preachers. They make an idol out of the gift of preaching. They want people to flock to their banner because they're such great preachers. 
And as a result, they're not working on pastoring. They're not working on listening to people. They're not working on evangelism. They're not working on, dis they working on their messages. They just want that more than anything else. It's an idol. And I know a lot of guys who don't want to even be in the ministry if they're not going to be great preachers, even though that's... In other words, they've got, you've, got, you've got this paradigm of how, what the ministry's got to look like. And it's all based on the mistaking of spiritual gifts for spiritual fruit. So you can make an idol out of truth. You can make, a, make an idol out of gifts. And of course, and this will literally take 30 seconds, uh, I just wrote the, my book on the prodigal is about this, of course. And that is, it is typical for Christians to take their, it's garden variety legalism. It's very typical for Christians to say, the reason God loves me is because I'm so sold out for the Lord. I come to church, I take notes on the sermon, I'm praying, I'm having my quiet time, I'm just saying no to all this bad stuff, I'm trying to obey the Ten Commandments, surely God has to bless me, He has to answer my prayers. That's garden variety moralism and legalism. And it's taking a moral record, which is a good thing, Moral righteousness, which is a great thing. Holiness, which is a great thing, and turning it into an idol. Trusting in that instead of in God. Trusting in truth instead of in God. Trusting in your ministry success instead of in God. I'll tell you something. Unless you know how to deal with those idols when you're preaching the gospel, you're actually not going to have, you're not going to produce converts or people that really live any differently because these are forms of worldliness. When you get out into the world, Everybody thinks they're right and they're bashing everybody. They make an idol out of their, their, that's called ideology. What's ideology? An idea turned into an idol. You know, my system of thought. Out there, ministry, out there success and giftedness and talent. I mean, you go out there and that's all, that's how everybody else is. And yet because we make idols out of truth and not make idols out of gifts and make idols out of our, our actual moral record inside the church, that's the reason why the world looks inside and doesn't see us living any different. That's the reason why we're not changing the culture. And there's an awful lot of people out there that say they're born again. Something like now 34% of the population says they've had a born again experience. You know, that's enough people. I doubt very much that a third of the population of Ephesus had become Christian. I doubt it. And yet there was enough people living lives of such distinctiveness that it was changing the economy. If a third of the people that said, hey, I've, I've been born again, I'm an evangelical Christian, uh, were living in a very different way, would change the culture. It's not, and here's one of the reasons why. Because when we communicate the gospel, we don't go after idols.